I'm going to show you, right, the EKGs, and you want to correlate the coronary anatomy to, uh, you know, to your heart. So we said, right, the, the coronary artery is coming from the aorta. So you see the right coronary artery, you see the left. The right coronary artery, right, uh, feeds the right atrium, the right ventricle, and the inferior wall. The left coronary artery, right, they have two branches, the left anterior descending, which feeds the septal wall. Let me use a different color. Right, the septal wall, and it feeds, right, the anterior wall of your left ventricle. The circumflex goes to the back and it feeds the lateral wall, right? And you see how it comes back, right? So it feeds the lateral wall. It can also feed this inferior portion of your heart. So inferior portion of the heart can be fed by the RCA, the right coronary artery, and the, the circ. And here we have the LAD, which feeds the septal wall and the anterior wall. Any questions about this? This is very important to understand once we do the 12 lead. Right? So, uh, and also, right, the, the right coronary artery is also going to feed uh, your uh, SA node and your AV node, right? So you see how it moves down. So those patients who develop Brady dysrhythmia, right, we can kind of correlate that Maybe the RCA is taking the hit, and RCA may be blocked proximally up. That's why they're showing me bradydysrhythmia. So the higher up this is blocked, the worse prognosis is for the patient, right? Uh, and also the right coronary artery feeds the right ventricle, right, which is preload-dependent portion of your heart, right? We talked about which phase in the cardiac cycle, right? The heart is perfused is during diastolic phase, right? Why is during, during diastolic phase? Is because we see here, right? when the uh, aortic valve closes, right, during diastole, the, the ostia is now open and the blood flow can go. But during systole, the aortic valve obstructs the flow of blood through these vessels, right? So they are not fed during systole, they're fed primarily during the diastolic portion of this, right? This, what I was explaining to you, right, this is the diast this is this is your EKG at the top, and this is your arterial waveform, right? So the arterial waveform uh, shows you, this is your systole, this portion where your diastole starts, and this is your diastolic phase. So look, this, this heart rate is 60 beats per minute. You see how much the shaded area, how much time I spend during diastole versus opposed to when my heart rate becomes 130. You see the difference, how much less? And if you know that your heart coronary arteries are being fed during the diastolic portion of it, right? If your heart becomes very, very fast, I'm not feeding these coronary arteries. And your heart becomes more irritable and more uh, sustained tachydysrhythmias. So that's why they're going to give them some beta blockers in the hospital if they have a heart rate of 130 to bring them down to maybe heart rate of 60 where I increase my diastolic phase. So I make it this much. So this is where during diastole, right, is where I will get the flow of blood through these coronaries, right? So this is what they say, right? Coronary blood flow is determined by duration of the diastolic relaxation, right? Uh, here uh, is just a schematic representation that I was showing you, right? If you have a thrombus formation here and these vessels go in through the wall, this is how you make the transmural MI because it's going to go through all these layers, endocardium, myocardium, epicardium. And this is what becomes necrotic first. And then it be basically the necrosis expands like this, making its way from inside out. And this is why we see this type of uh, um, diagram, right? So, right, you see the, the zone of necrosis and it expands the longer you uh, uh, wait or the longer the patient waits to call, uh, you know, 911 or get taken to the hospital, right? So now let's look, let's look, right? Uh, so these, uh, how it really looks, right? These are the arteries that penetrate it through. So now look, let's look at the EKGs, uh, which you actually see and how it develops. So the initially, right, uh, here, right, this, this tissue is becoming uh, ischemic, but yet it still is not uh, dead, right? So in the initial phase, the more ischemia is setting in, you see T-wave inversions, right, from here to here. So you see T-wave, uh, uh, sorry, 
ST segment depressions. So first it starts with ST segment depression. This is the ST segment. So ST segment gets depressed. And the more ischemic it becomes, you start to see T wave inversions. The moment it goes into necrosis, you start to see this. This is called ST segment elevation, right? So why is it ST segment elevation? This is PQR and S T is now elevated. And if you don't, don't do nothing about it, right? Death is set in, infarction set in. You see these deep Q waves develop. They call them before, before STEMI and STEMI, they call them Q wave MI, non Q wave MI. Q wave MI mean you develop these prolonged pathological Q waves, right? So this is basically, once you look at the Twowley, right? This is what I'm going to be looking, right? Where's the elevation? Where's the depression, right? So I'm gonna show you about the leads, but this is basically how this is conducted, right? So let's, let me just show you. Uh, this is the ST segment, and this is what we're gonna be measuring from here to here, right? This is what we wanna know. Uh, we're gonna be measuring the boxes. Now, very important to note, right? You wanna basically, uh, you, you're not looking at uh, this initially. I'm not looking at the ST segment first. What I'm doing first, I wanna find the T wave and I wanna find the P wave. Why do I wanna find the T and the P wave? The reason I wanna do that is because I wanna find the TP segment from T, right, to P. And the moment I do that, this is my baseline. I now can, uh, if I draw this line here, I know what's the baseline of my AKG. I gotta get that first. The way you get the baseline first, you gotta find the T to P segment, right? Not just the P wave and then start to look, you're gonna m mess this up. So I find my T to P segment as they show you here. And then, right, as I draw my lines, right, I start to count the boxes, one, two, three, four, five. So here, right, they tell me I have ST segment deviation or ST segment elevation of five millimeters. The longer or the bigger this amount, the more uh, significant the MI is or the worse the MI is, right? Here, same thing, right? I found my first, I found my T wave, I found my P wave, I found my T2P segment, and I draw my line. In the pre-hospital setting, what I do is I basically, I tear out uh, EKG paper, right? And I basically turn it over and I kind of like fold it over my uh, segment. So it kind of gives me a, a rough idea where it's gonna be. And from here to here, I basically count one, two, you know, three, four, 4.5 boxes. So 4.5 boxes, right, is a significant elevation. Uh, so that's what they say, right? Five, the, the, your value is any ST segment elevation. But if you look in your protocols, right, they basically say uh, greater or equal than one millimeter, right? So now, well, so basically how the EKG knows, right? So th these are your limb leads. It's basically think of it like this. If I took cameras and I pointed at your heart and I'm looking at different aspects of the heart, right? So this is what I'm doing. It's like taking pictures of your heart at different locations, right? So, uh, and the precordial leads that are on your chest, they basically envelop your heart and they look, right? V1, V2, your septal wall. V3, V4, your anterior wall, right? V5, V6, they start to look at your lateral wall at the side here because your leads are like this. And this is your heart. This is your right ventricle. This is your left ventricle, right? So now, now that you know all this, right? Now let's look, right? How the 12 lead corresponds to right coronary artery, left coronary artery, and so forth, right? So uh, lateral wall. Lateral wall is the circumflex artery. The circ, right? Uh, and usually what you're going to see on the uh, infarction, on the circumflex, it's usually going to be uh, V5, V6, 1, and AVL. So V5, V6, 1, and AVL will be your circumflex uh, coronary artery and your lateral infarct. Now, your anterior infarct is usually... Uh, V1, V2, V3, V4, so the entire branch here. Uh, sometimes if you only have isolated infarct to V1 and V2 only, we're going to say that's the septal wall, right, septal. Which coronary arteries involved is the left anterior descending. Now, what? let me ask you this question. What if you have both? Uh, you have elevations in V5, V6, one AVL, V1, V2, V3, V4. What do you think you got? Anterior lateral wall. 
So where's my blockage? Oh, this still proximal. It's proximal, so it's supposed yeah. to circumflex. In Excellent, there. right? So my blockage is probably here. Because if my blockage is here, the diagnostic features I expect to see is all of this is not being fed. All of this is not being fed. Then I'll see ST segment elevation in both V1, V2, V3, V4, septal wall, anterior wall, and the circumflex. One AVL, V5, V6. But let's say I only have elevations, right, in here. V5, uh, sorry, V3 and V4. So my blockage is probably distal. So it's only maybe blocking my anterior wall. So I, I only have anterior infarction. So based on the elevation you, you see on the EKG can kind of give you a rough idea where the elevation may be occurring, right? Here we see infarction posterior wall. Usually it will be manifested as depressions, right, uh, uh, in here. So V1, V2 will show you ST segment depressions. If you do a posterior wall, I'll show you in a second how that looks. Uh, you're going to see elevations, but uh, that's what they show. Inferior wall am I, right? Inferior is here. It's uh, lead 2, lead 3, AVF. Usually the right coronary artery is involved. And for some patients can be, right? You see how they say or? So it could be the circ as well, because the circumflex comes all the way down here and it could feed the inferior wall, right? So RCA or the circumflex is the 2, 3, AVF. This is basically uh, when you print the 12 EDKG, right? Uh, you will see like these subdivisions, right? And if you see these subdivisions, this is how they subdivide. So basically you got inferior is 2, 3 AVF. You have the lateral is V5, V6, 1 and AVL. Subtle being V1, V2, anterior V3, V4, right? But uh, sometimes you may have a combination of them. So if you have a combination, you have probably... Uh, and the my that's bigger, right, in size. So here they show you where the infarcts can occur, and you can correlate that with the 12 ECG printout, right? So uh, this is, I will post these slides, but basically you see, right, they how they subdivide. So anterior septal, right, they'll give you uh, uh, V1, V2, V3, anterior, right, basically all the V leads, V1, V2, V3, V4. Anterior lateral, so you have the lateral side, one in AVL now involved, right? If you have the pure lateral side, it's one in AVL. Inferior is two, three AVF, right? And so forth. So what you want to do is you want to kind of correlate, first of all, which leads are elevated. Once I know which leads are elevated, I want to then link it to which wall? Inferior, anterior, septal, anterior lateral, lateral, right? And once I know which wall is innervated, then I have to recall which coronary arteries involved. So anterior, anterior septal, right? This is probably my left anterior descending branch of the left coronary artery. Anterior, this is left anterior descending of the left coronary artery. Anterior lateral, this is the circumflex and the left anterior descending. Lateral, this is the circumflex artery. Inferior, it would be right coronary artery plus the circ, right? And so forth. This is how you want to uh, keep this in mind. True posterior is probably going to be the right coronary artery. Right ventricular is going to be right coronary artery. Right? Now, uh, here, uh, they, sh they, they will explain basically what sensitivity and specificity. So this basically shows you the uh, sensitivity being ability to test correctly for this. And then specificity, you basically want to make sure you identify those without the disease because you don't want to have false positive results. So they will show you, right? Uh, if you have, let's say, in lead three, the elevation is greater than lead two, most likely you're dealing with right coronary artery, your sensitiv sensitivity being 90%, specificity being 71%. So that's very high, extremely high, right? Uh, and uh, I will leave these slides up so you could go through it and it will correlate to which coronary artery is involved, right? And which where the elevations are witnessed right so uh right so again just to show you so we see normal normal ekg no elevations in all leads right i look through it now let's look at the this lead right so let me ask you before i tell you the answer where do you see elevations which leads two three avf two three avf anywhere else yeah, no. 
D2. What about, what about, five. sorry, let me go back. What about, what about this? What about this? D2. Six. Yeah, V5, V6. V5, V6. Six. Yeah. Mm. So this is all elevated, right? And you also have reciprocal changes, right? Reciprocal changes means it's the, you know, you're looking at the opposite side. So this is being the inferior wall. This is being the lateral wall. And you see the posterior wall. So the backside of the heart, you see these depressions. You see how it's depressed? Yeah. So this is very pathognomonic of the STEMI. So this one is where you count the boxes, right? Uh, and how would you call this uh, MI? If I were to say it, inferior, lateral, um, how would I call this? Inferior lateral. Yeah, MI. so this is the, correct. <laughs> inferior lateral MI, right? And which coronary arteries involved? Circumflex. Yeah, the circ and probably the RCA, right? And we possibly might have the posterior artery here, right? So this is your uh, REMAC protocols, right? And what they say, right? So anytime you have at least one millimeter ST segment elevation in two or more contiguous leads, you're basically going to call online medical control, right? You're going to transmit your EKG, right? And then they're going to basically authorize you to take them to the STEMI center, right? That's what you're going to do, right? And the reciprocal changes basically means it's looking at the leads on the opposite side and it's showing you uh, uh, like depressions or the opposite view, right? So if you have those, it's very specific and sensitive to that MI. So this is very clear cut, right? By the way, let me ask you this question. Let's say you have this EKG, like we just, we got a patient 65 years old. We just ran this, we got this EKG, right? Why should I call online medical control? Why can't I just take them to the, to the STEMI center? I know I'm one block away from this hospital. It has a STEMI center. I work in the 91 system. Why should I call online medical control? I don't know. If you if you don't call and you take them to that facility, you'll be restricted. Maybe because the type of STEMI, like, may might need a certain type of resource to to like fix. And, uh, no, any STEMI has the same resource. It's a cath lab. They open up. Uh, so this, the, this, it's not because of this the STEMI. So basically, the problem here that you have is this. You know how we say time is muscle. So you got a guy who's having an active heart attack. He's, this is his heart. This is this is his EKG, right? I connected to my monitor. I printed. He's having chest pain. Clear cut. Right? No ambiguity. If I don't call telemetry, I will be restricted. And uh, if I take him on my own, uh, like to the cath lab, I will be restricted. And uh, the reason for this is the follows is because uh, you're standing there is because they call the, the STEMI center, the doctor calls the STEMI center, and they ask basically, they want to verify that that cardiologist, the interventional cardiologist is there and he's present. Because sometimes, you know, uh, those doctors, they're very high earners, and that cath lab may be only be open from nine to five, or maybe only on Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, or maybe on certain, you know, weekends it's closed. So they have to call and to verify that the, that the doctor, the cardiologist is there because if you bring that person without calling online medical control, just because you thought it was a STEMI center, what happens then is they uh, basically keep this patient in the ER. They call one of these private companies uh, to transfer them to a different location. So basically you extend his window from maybe, uh, you know, going to the cath lab right away to like three hour uh, time frame, where if he had infarcted vessel, he definitely is going to have a, non-viable myocardium. So the reason why you call online medical control is that they have to call the cath lab, verify that the cardiologist is in fact there. So my advice to you, if you don't want to be restricted in the 911 system, call medical control and get authorization so that they call and they tell you which cath lab to take them to. Uh, hopefully that's clear. Right. So this is how we subdivide the EKG, right? And uh, this is the correlates to the anatomical regions, right? So if I cut this up into these segments, right? You see, right, I, I have elevations in the inferior leads. I have elevations in my lateral lead. So I will say this is inferior lateral MI. I have reciprocal changes, right, in AVL, right? Uh, lead V1, V2, which might be posterior wall involvement as well, right? Any questions about this? This would be, I would say, knowing, knowing this uh, chart, the coronary, uh, coronary, Artery anatomy and this and where the elevation is occurring, 
this will be probably be uh, like I would say 95% of what you need to know to be a paramedic in your city system. All right, this is like 95%. So if you have no questions here, uh, uh, that's good, right? So, uh, so again, plaque formed, right? Person is exhibiting the signs and symptoms. We do the 12 EDKG. We found inferior wall, right? What's going to happen next? You're going to call telemetry. You're going to send this EKG. You're going to say, okay, take them to hospital X, right? We just verified. And what's going to happen there? You're going to bring this person, uh, the, the interventional cardiologist, because after looking at your 12 lead, right, is going to say, okay, I think it's probably coronary uh, um, artery, inf uh, right coronary artery. He's going to put a catheter, right, into the groin, right? He's going to go through the femoral axis. They're going to basically move this wire, the catheter, all the way to the heart. And they're going to push dye on the fluoroscopy, and they're going to visualize all these vessels that are coming off your heart, right? Not just your right coronary, left coronary, but basically all of them. You're going to push die and he's going to see where the blockage is occurring. Once he determines where the blockage is, right, they're going to push a balloon and they're going to extend, uh, extend over it. This is, this is what, if you are a cardiologist, this is what is, is in your future. You're going to need to know all of these uh, subdivisions because all of these could get uh, a stent. When I'm in CCU, right, if, I'm not, if they didn't tell me where the stent is, I call the cath lab and I say, which vessel? And they tell me, okay, you know, they place it mid LED 13, right? So I know where the stent is located. Uh, uh, so I know, you know where the location is. So, but this is all these coronary arteries. This is where the stenting is occurring, right? Um, so you see how they, the, this is from uh, Neuter's Anatomy. You see how much of uh, subdivisions of these arteries for your purposes, as long as you remember, right? The right coronary artery, you remember the left coronary artery in the, the circ and the LAD, you're good. So you see how much less information you have to know? Uh, so, right? so this is, this is basically how it works. You see how he's coming in with the catheter, right? And then let's say if the, uh, he pushes dye, and as the dye is going through, if there's a blockage here, right, this is not going to be visualized. You're only going to see, right, let's say th this side, and this side is, is not going to be visualized. So then they look at the fluoroscopy, and they determine where is the occluded vessel. So here they have the atherosclerotic narrowing, or there could be a thrombus uh, narrowing. They put a basically a balloon, right? You see how it comes, right? So they put a balloon, they inflate the balloon. Once the balloon is inflated, right, like this, right? Balloon is inflated. Uh, the inflation of the balloon is going to extend this catheter. The catheter is this metal piece that stands uh, your vessel open. They usually coat it with specific uh, medications, that do not allow, you know, further thrombus formation. This is how the cath lab looks. I don't know if you guys ever been to it, right? Patient is not under anesthesia. Uh, they are alert, right? And uh, they're doing this procedure real time, right? Uh, when you are doing direct admit to the cath lab, you're basically going to bypass the ED. You're going to bring your stretcher right here. You're going to transfer over the patient to the cath lab table. You're going to hand them your 12 lead. You're going to give you a concise report. We've got a 65 year old male patient presents with one hour duration chest pain. Uh, patient's history is hypertension uh, CAD. 12 lead shows inferior wall MI, 23 AVF. This is the first EKG I got on scene. This is 10 minutes in transport. This is 15 minutes, you know, prior to departure in here. Patient received aspirin, 324 milligrams, right? We withheld nitroglycerin, possible right ventricular involvement, right? And this is my vital signs. So concise, right? Uh, reporting. Uh, this is how it looks basically, right? You're normal. And as this, the elevation and necrosis is ongoing, this is what you're going to see, right? The moment it gets to a uh, later phase, right? Uh, if your stent is deployed in time, let's say you could salvage the myocardium, right? At this stage, you place the stent, you, your depressions will subside and you may, if you did it in fast enough time, you may have resolutions of these ST segment changes and you may have normal, um, right? Normal EKG now. So this is what happens. They inflate the, the balloon, right? And the stent is remain the smash, right? And this is how it looks. Obviously it's, it's smaller, right? But that's, that's the idea, right? So this shows you uh, the lipid de deposit, the tunica uh, media, and when it ruptures, how this will basically uh, close this vessel, right? This is the plaque. 
This is the actual catheter with the balloon. They will inflate this, right? This is the arterial wall. And they will leave the stent in place of whatever it may be. By the way, this is the guy. His name was Andreas uh, Roland uh, Gronsek. He was a radiologist. And in 1976, right, he, uh, 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 he explained this procedure, right, uh, in the AHA. He basically gave his poster. And he said, you know, we could do this. I think he did it in, uh, at that time in animals. And he said, we could do this in, in people. They thought he was crazy. He was insane. And he explained this. And all the cardiologists rejected him. They said, this guy is crazy. Uh, he's placing wires and, you know, all these things. Uh, he's nuts. But radiologists, those guys, right, uh, who do procedures like for your veins, arteries, uh, they said, no, this is actually very smart. And then they adopted this. Uh, and uh, he actually did this procedure, right? He did. He opened the coronary artery, right, with his vessel uh, on the first patient, right, in 1977, right? Uh, so he basically placed the stent, opened the artery, right? Uh, and afterwards, the moment he did it, right? He was American. He was the, the hero with a standing ovation in AHA in the one year later. So one year, you go from being crazy to getting a standing ovation, right? Just, uh, just like that. But he was the one who pioneered this uh, procedure, right? And this is the current AHA protocol that you have, right? So it begins, if you notice, right? It starts with EMS arrival, so it's early recognition, so you do early 12 EDKG. You determine, right, uh, if there's ST segment elevation, uh, and after doing your physical assessment findings, which I showed you, right, you're then going to provide the necessary treatment, aspirin, nitroglycerin, right? We don't have morphine here. And, right, very important, right? The reason why I told you about time, right, you notice for the hospital, they either have uh, 90, less than 90 minutes to inflate that balloon, right? To put a stent. Uh, so they want to have 90 minutes to PCI. Or if they don't meet that time frame, they got to give them fibrinolytics. Anyone know what, what, uh, what is this fibrinolytics? It's like TPA. No? TPA, exactly. They yeah. either, they either got to put a stent to open your artery in 90 minutes or within 30 minutes, I got to give you lytics. So that means is that if you bring a person, right, let's say to the non cath lab capable facility, right, that hospital, if they don't have the capability of move that person within 90 minutes to that uh, hospital that has a cath lab, they basically got to give them a uh, clot busting drug. The problem with this clot busting drug, it not only opens uh, clots in your heart, it can open up all sorts of clots. So you could bleed in your brain, you could bleed elsewhere in your body. So there's a high risk these drugs that's why it's very important to take the person to the proper destination right uh, so what they do in the hospital right they will monitor their troponins they will do an, an x-ray for them to make to rule out possible pneumonia rule out possible cor uh, uh, aortic dissection right uh, uh, and usually th this reperfusion therapy is only done if it's less than or equal to 12 hours if it's greater than 12 hours of chest pain right, then they're going to be admitted probably to the CCU, right, and uh, they will monitor them there, right, but the very important thing for you guys is early recognition, so it means early 12 EDKG, right, and based on that, that's when you're making your decision uh, in terms of what you're doing. So this is the current AHA guideline for uh, STEMI and STEMI, right, and uh, the pathway that you're going to take, right, so this is, this is, why, this is why I told you the time frame. Uh, they call it they call it door to balloon time. Why? Because door from the moment patient enters the door of the hospital to the balloon has to be ninety minutes. Or door to needle time, the moment they hit the door to the moment you start TPA, right? For brinolysis has to be thirty minutes. So this is why we obtain this time. When did your chest pain start? Right. So you know you're within that twelve hour time window. Right. You're within this twelve hour. And then when you bring them to that location, the moment they hit through the doors, that's when this time starts, 90 minutes and 30 minutes. Let's say you brought them to the non-PCI center, right? They cannot move them. They cannot call a company fast enough to get them out. They got to give them lytics so they're going to get sued. Uh, if, they, if, if, they, if they can get them to a cath lab capable within 90 minutes, that's fine. That's why you, rather you take them to the correct location to begin with. I, you don't know how many patients I transferred uh, from one hospital to another because they were brought to the wrong facility. They had a STEMI and they were brought to the incorrect hospital. Uh, every, every week I would have these transports, right? So that's that, right? Um, this is just uh, 
post uh, cardiac arrest. So the other important uh, reason why you have in your post cardiac arrest uh, also assessment of STEMI is because if you bring somebody back from a, uh, from a cardiac arrest and you got pulses back and you did a 12 EDKG and the 12 EDKG shows UST segment elevation myocardial infarction, where do you think you're going to be taking them? STEMI center. STEMI center, right? Why STEMI center? Because their cause of heart attack, uh, sorry, cardiac arrest was that plaque. And the only way you could remove that plaque is to open up the coronary, coronary vessel. So that's why every time we do a cardiac arrest, we get pulses back, right? We want to get the 12 lead right away. You get a 12 lead, determine if it's a STEMI. If it's a STEMI, you, the same thing, you call online medical control, you say, okay, we got a you know 65-year-old male patient, post-cardiac arrest, you, we got ROSC, we got a positive STEMI, we want to transmit, we want to take them to the STEMI center, right? Same, same um, stuff going forward, right? So this is your 12 EDKG. We're going to do practice uh, skills in the lab, how to apply it, right? Uh, there's also something known as a 15 lead EKG. This basically looks at the right ventricle and the posterior wall. Remember I said when you have inferior wall and you want to be cautious with your nitrates, with nitroglycerin, especially if you have right ventricular involvement because this is the preload dependent side. And I, if I did this, uh, 15 lead EKG, I basically what I do is I take V4, I put it on the right side, I take V5 and V6 and I put on the back of the chest, on the back of the wall like this. So I can look at the back side of the heart, right? Back of your heart. And I can look at the right side of the heart. And then what I basically do is I print another 12 lead EKG. And what I do is I basically relabel. I, I say this is V4R. So V4 right side. This is V8, V9 looking at the posterior wall. And if I have uh, elevation, like you see elevation here, elevation here, I can say not only does this patient has inferior wall MI, this patient also has right ventricular involvement because he has right side elevations and he has posterior wall MI. So he probably his RCA is blocked way, way up, proximal RCA blockage, right? So this guy would... Is this guy, I want to give him nitroglycerin? Of course. No. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is the guy you do not want to give nitro, right? So nitrates is contraindicated. This is, not, this is a study, basically. And you will say, you know, is this diagnostic? Is this effective? Yeah, they did a study looking at these leads on patients, V4R, V8, V9. Uh, they basically said, yes, 15 lead DKG provides increased sensitivity, right? Uh, odds of detecting ST segment elevation in acute MI and with no loss of specificity. So they basically use this to expand their selection of thrombolytic therapy. Because if you're going to give lytics, you know, in these conditions, you want to make sure you catch all the patients who have the MI. So this is the 15 EDKG. And then this is a chase study, right, where they looked at the V4R. You know, they'll say, how effective is V4R? They said that the sensitivity and specificity was 82.7 and 76.9, so very, very predictive value, right? So negative predictive value, 87. So meaning those patients who are not having right ventricular involvement, they will be excluded. So it's good to, to perform this if you have inferior wall MI, do the right side EKG, do the posterior EKG, and they're very specific and sensitive, right? So uh, the, the last part of this is basically gonna be the treatment. We're pretty much uh, at the end point, right? So the treatment, uh, First, you want to give your uh, oxygen if the saturation is less than 90. Remember, if the saturation is above 90, you do not give oxygen for AHA and your NREMT protocols. Why? Because you're going to cause free radical damage. So only oxygen in the setting of ACS if your pulse ox is uh, less than 90. So I should draw it like this. Less than 90, you're going to go give O2. If your pulse ox is greater than 90, you would hold O2. Right. Um, so this is for the MI. You're going to titrate your oxygen based on the saturation. I do not want to see 100%. So I give them two liters per minute, right? And I start. The next thing we want to give them, if they don't have allergies, we're going to give them aspirin. So uh, 324 milligrams PO. You're going to have them chewing, chew it, right? Uh, and this medication stops platelet from aggregating. By the way, this, this aspirin must be non enteric coated, right? It should say non enteric coated on the bottle. So, and this is the only medicine that reduces your mortality, the risk of death by 23%, right? 
Not, no other medication does it. So if, if I said in the setting of a heart attack, you give aspirin, you reduce the chance of them dying by almost 25%. That's the best thing you could do for them, right? Uh, the way aspirin works, it blocks, right? The platelet adhesion via the cyclic cyclooxygenase pathway, right? So you don't have platelet, platelet aggregation. Nitrates, right? There is no redu reduction of mortality. The reason why you give nitrates is you want to basically help them with their chest pain. But, you know, in your book, you probably read it does, it does coronary artery dilation, right? It does, it dilates coronary arteries. And I'll tell you this, well, let me ask you this. You got a guy, 65 years old, he has a 20, 20 year history of coronary artery disease and he has CAD, he has hypertension and diabetes. He has a lot of plaque in his coronary arteries. How much do you think it dilates with me giving them nitro? No, oh, not, much. not much. Yeah, it's, there's basically no elastic uh, recoil for those patients. So really what you're doing is you are, what you're doing the way it's going to work for them is you are dropping their preload. So if you drop the preload, there is le less blood in the ventricle, the rest, there's less pressure pushing out, right? So let me, let me see if you, you could understand this. Imagine this is your this is your heart, right? And this is your vessel that's now thrombosed. And this is your distal circulation. Here, there's a lot of CAD, right? So these vessels are not pliable. If I give you nitro, I'm going to drop your preload. So maybe before, the, this, this is the amount of blood that's pushing against these walls, right? Let's say I give you nitro, and I reduce the amount of preload to this much. So you could see there is less pressure being pushed against these walls. So less pressure is pushing outside. So maybe this pressure will reduce the amount of pressure pushing out on these walls so that maybe some blood can come in and go inside. So truly speaking, for those patients who have extensive CAD, nitro doesn't dilate coronary arteries. What it does is it reduces the preload and it reduces the intraventricular pressure here. So if I drop the pressure here, there's less amount of pressure pushing out against these walls, right? Maybe I'll get some perfusion going forward and maybe I'll get less chest pain. So that's how it works, right? Contraindication, right? It means when you cannot give it. So obviously you know about the blood pressure because it reduces the blood pressure, but then you cannot give it if you have bradycardia or you have tachycardia. And my question is why? Severe bradycardia and tachycardia causes what? Well, I know bradycardia causes no. hypotension, so I, maybe it goes along with that. So, so yeah. So, what the problem is this is if let's say even if your blood pressure is borderline, but you have severe bradycardia or you have severe tachycardia, you give this drug, you give nitro. I drop my preload, right? I drop my preload, and in the setting of tachycardia or bradycardia, I will not mount a compensatory response. You're basically going to bottom out the person. You're going to basically cause them to die. You will drop. You will vasodilate them. Preload drops. And in the setting of slow heart rate or fast heart rate, right? You don't have enough filling time. Uh, so they will precipitously drop. My advice to you guys, anyone who you're giving nitro to on the ALS level, right? Always, always do a 12 EKG before to rule out right ventricular involvement or inferior wall MI. Two, before you give nit nitro, make sure you have IV access in place. Why? Because if you give it and they precipitously drop, you could just basically open your IV line and have them laying flat on your stretcher. If you give them nitro, they're not on your stretcher, you do not have IV line and they drop, you're in a lot of problems because the blood pressure is now down. You cannot get, gain IV access because you, his vasculature or her vasculature is collapsed. You cannot start IV, you cannot give IV fluids. You're praying to a higher power that this person returns, right? So my advice to you, before you give nitro, 12 EDKG to rule out possible RV infarction, IV in place, so that if he bottoms out, she bottoms out, uh, you can start IV fluids, patient is on your stretcher or lying flat uh, or semi fowlers, right? Hopefully that's clear, right? Does not reduce mortality. Uh, so the only drug that reduces mortality is your aspirin. 